the coverage in the archives is extremely broad, and uh, it's extremely personal to Winnipeg and to Manitoba, and so therefore it makes, I think, um, a good uh, source for students and for scholars and researchers and the public who might be interested in any of these topics. People come here with a sense of expectation and a sense of excitement. They're looking for something that will fill a need or a um, niche in their research and um, when you can give that to them they're just so happy and they're so excited and it can be very uh, exciting for yourself. The primary materials give you um, an opportunity to access contemporary accounts of what people understood what was going on. And so if you want to represent uh, some aspect of history relating to Winnipeg and Manitoba, um, it really is important to get first-hand accounts and to uh, access the, the uh, papers of people who are alive at the time. In addition to our archival materials, of course, we have the rare book room, which contains a number, about 30,000 volumes of rare books. When I finally managed to make my way down here and see what was available in the collection, I was absolutely flabbergasted to find the variety of the collection and also I think the historical importance of the collection. The one book in particular that, that caught my attention was one that from a very quick glance at I realized was far earlier than, than had been up to that point realized. It, it's a book of psalms with a commentary by Peter Lombard. And that book had been made probably between 1200 and 1233. Books often contain a great deal of information about how they were read, how they were used, how people understood the book to exist in their lives. It's just not the kind of information you can get if you're looking at, say, a later edition, which is very useful for looking at the particular text in a book, but doesn't convey that other information like, who read this? Why did they read it? What did they think they were doing when they were reading a book? Some of the images look like they've been used, in fact. Some of the images, for example, we have an image of the Virgin Mary, and it looks like her dress has been rubbed away, possibly from somebody who is doing some personal meditation or personal devotion, and was actually touching Mary's dress, much like one of the figures in the painting itself. So they were sort of repeating that process, because for whatever reason for them, that had an important emotional or sort of spiritual connection. The documents that are in this collection form a very helpful uh, sampling of the history of, of the book, uh, in this case the history of the English Bible. These Bibles really range from uh, the, the, what's called the Matthews Bible uh, from 1537, the Great Bible, which is the first English Bible that was authorized for use in English churches, that dates from 1539. The, the Geneva Bible uh, from 1560, uh, the Bishop's Bible from 1568, and also a 1611 King James Bible. By looking at them closely side by side, you can see changes in the way that the text is treated. Every time a text is, is printed, it's embodied in a specific material and social way. There is a, a different way of even thinking about the text that is captured uh, by the information around the text. How they were embodied tells us a lot about how they were used and how they were thought about and gives us insights into then how they were interpreted and read. Personally, I just found it really fascinating. It was a really uh, uh, exciting experience to get a chance to get a hold of and you know get to look and leaf through a lot of the texts uh, uh, that you just never really would expect to have the opportunity to look at. I actually did a bit of a project on the Legenda Aurea, which for me was actually completely unfamiliar at the time. But but as I got into it, it was really interesting to uh, to learn about a text that was such a popular uh, book in the Middle Ages. 
<laughs> after that, I also did a, a bit of a project on William Morris. So it was a different time period, and I actually also did one on William Blake. One thing that I've really found about working with the actual first-hand materials is that it gives you a really good sense about the text, about the book itself. I know that I've looked at images in um, other texts where you'll have maybe a facsimile or a photocopy just of a single image from a text, and it's really hard to get a sense about what the context is or, or where this image comes from or how it fits in with the rest of the information. And I found that uh, really it really helps me get a, a, a better understanding of the, uh, the book and the practices surrounding the use of that book uh, when I have access to the book itself. These are descriptions of plant life often to be used in medicine or just to document plants in a particular place. We have a number of botanicals and herbals, old ones, in our collection, and they're beautiful. Pliny uh, wrote this uh, natural history. Uh, it's the only surviving work of his. And this German example from the late 16th century has some of the best block print illustrations in the 16th century. In this book, uh, it's called Four Edge Painting, and it's not illustrating the text per se, but it's applying a graphic design to the object of the book itself. Um, essentially, uh, the four edge, meaning the front edge of the pages, just here, uh, is fanned in such a way that a slight fat flat edge of each sheet is exposed, and then a painting is put there, and then it comes back together and you can no longer see the picture. Ephemera are, well, ephemeral printed materials, um, which are printed matter that were meant to be thrown away. Often, especially in a place like Manitoba, which is a very new place, the earliest material that you'll find is ephemeral material. It's just fascinating in so many different ways that, I mean, the, working with the old stuff is really great because you just can't believe that it's lasted this long and that your hands are touching this paper that who knows how many other hands have touched over time. And you think about all of the people who have had contact with this material. I never thought in my wildest dreams that this, when I studied to be a librarian, that this is what I would end up doing. And I feel lucky every single day. Well, it's very nice to work in the uh, archives and special collections here. It's, uh, I find it very relaxed. The, the new archives uh, room, where we are right now, is beautiful and comfortable. I love bringing students here. I found it particularly helpful to work here. The people here are fantastic and they really want people to use the collections, to come in and study them, to see what we can learn about the books, about the people who made these books. And I think that that opportunity is one that most archives, I think, offer. This one is a unique opportunity in Western Canada to have access to manuscripts, to have access to rare books. because. First of all, they're just not widely available in Western Canada, and second of all, because those who are responsible for the archives here really want people to use them and go to great lengths to ensure that we can use them and that we can make as much use of them as possible in our research.